is the second wake up, and we're going to try and um, finish up static stability today. And we'll look at the lateral directional. Lateral usually uh, pertains to rolling and directional is yawing. Okay. And these two motions are intricately coupled with each other. As if you remember uh, from the kinetic equations of rotational motion, right? Those two equations. The rolling moment and the pitching and the yawing moment, the roll rate and the yaw rate are coupled with each other in the dynamics. So just like we did for longitudinal flight, we will look at the forces and moments involved here. And remember the lateral directional variables are psi, t, uh, p, r. Uh, Those are the states of lateral directional motion. This is the side force. Um, you have the, the rolling moment. stands for aerodynamic. And so we'll look at the constitution of these forces. And just like lift and drag, this is CYQS, where CY is the side force uh, coefficient, CL, QS, and then moment arm, B, which is the scale of NA or WA. NA. Going out and CM QS. Now we need to look further into the constitution of these coefficients. And again, we are going to follow the same set of steps as we did for longitudinal flight and use Taylor series expansion and we're going to truncate at the first order terms. So from Taylor series, you have CY0 plus CY beta plus beta, CY delta A, delta A, CY delta R, delta R. CL is CL0 plus CL beta plus beta, That's something I missed in the set, beta. If you remember, beta is a substitution for V. The Y direction, uh, speed component. Delta A is the aileron deflection. And delta R is the vertical reflection. And these leading terms are defined in the usual sense, right? The usual sense being the value of Cy at beta, delta A, and delta R, which equal to zero. Right? So Cy zero is Cy at Beta, and so on. 
And the final comment here is that, again, these expansions are under normal conditions. By normal, we mean you know, subsonic flight, uh, not very high angle for tap. And you know, normal uh, flow conditions. So in general, also functions of Mach number, Reynolds number, uh, and you know, if, if you want to look at high angle of attack conditions, then alpha at high angle of attack flight. But we're going to assume that these are all moderate. So that we can continue to use these simplified expressions to essentially Taylor series expansions. Okay. So we'll look at each one of these three expressions or uh, relationships today and then talk about the signs of these derivatives. Okay. So we're going to start with the first one, the side force coefficient, and we look at each one of these. So CY0 is typically This is because of symmetry of the end. Okay. Unless you have, again, ex extreme flight conditions where there are vortices being shared and Mach number is high and so on, only under those conditions, these it may acquire a small positive or negative value. But in most uh, normal conditions, it will be zero. Cy beta first one that we look at, which is non-negligible. And so this is Cy partial Cy partial beta. And of course, evaluated at beta equal to zero, delta A equal to zero, and delta R equal to zero. Evaluated at the norm. <coughs> so in order to determine what this would look like, we need to first define what a positive side slip is. Right. Because essentially Cy beta is the ratio of change in Cy over change in beta. So this is how a positive side slip is defined. If you look at the top view of an aircraft, again conventional aircraft. So here's the top view, so this is the V1 axis. So positive side slip is defined like this. The infinity coming in like that now offset in the xy plane. <clears throat> okay. So there is wind coming in on the right wing. It is defined as positive side slip. That's just a convention. So this being said, this being a positive side slip angle, a change from beta equal to zero, right? The nominal fl flight again improves. You would normally be flying at beta equal to zero. So something happens, and this positive side slip is induced. So what would be the resulting CY? Well, this flow is going to make the tail, this vertical tail, generate a force. Flow coming in like that going to generate a force in this direction. And therefore, if you look at the direction of this force, this is opposite to V2. Right? So beta positive generates Fy along minus which means that Cy beta must be less than zero. This is typical. Okay. Now this has nothing to do with stability yet. We'll look at stability when we get to this derivative and this derivative. So this is just a natural response of the aircraft 
to a positive side side. Um, are we going to just typically regard FY as like acting just on the uh, ripple tail, not so much on like, the fuselage? And the right, so the contribution of fuselage and the wing is small for the side force because of the overall symmetry of the aircraft. So the, the reason we have this vertical tail, the main reason is to generate the side forces and the uh, yawing moments. Okay, so just like the computer CL alpha, so similar to CL alpha, I'm not going to repeat the computations here. C by beta can be computed to be approximately C by beta equals minus C alpha vertical 1 minus D sigma D beta D, D beta beta B S B over S. This is an analogous expression analogous to C L alpha of the vertical uh, of the horizontal tail. So we're going to define what those terms are. So over there, C L alpha V is essentially the C L alpha of the vertical tail. Right? Depends on what airfoil was used to construct the vertical tail. D sigma D beta is just like downwash, this is side wash. D epsilon D alpha on horizontal table. Okay. And beta V is defined. Similarly, this is ratio of the dynamic pressure at the vertical tail to the free stream dynamic pressure. And SV is the tail area, vertical tail area. Okay. So that's Cy beta. The next derivative in that expansion is Cy delta A, which is again the change in side force because of an aileron deflection. <coughs> so you deflect the aileron here, what is going to be the change in the side force? And there is no immediate reason that comes to mind why a side force need to, needs to be generated when an aileron is deflected. Okay? This is approximately zero. Cy delta r. Again, this is dcy d delta r. So this is change in the side force when, when the rudder is deflected. Right? This is a change in rudder deflection. So as you would expect, this will be substantial. Right? Because the rudder is a control surface attached to the vertical tail. So if you change its shape, the side force is going to change. Okay? Because the vertical tail essentially is the primary generator of the side force. So the way we define it, we need to first define a positive rudder deflection. So delta r greater than zero is defined as trailing edge left. So from top view, this is what a positive deflection will look like. So you have 
undetected rudder, and then reflection to the left. This is a positive rudder reflection by definition. So as you can see, the camber is like this, right? So the resulting side force would be in which direction? Exactly. It's going to be like that. Right? It's just the lift turned sideways. Sideways. And as you can see, this is also the direction of positive B2, right? B2 is to the right. So we expect Cy delta R to be positive or negative. A positive rudder deflection leads to force in the positive direction. So the ratio is greater than zero. Okay. Positive beta leads to uh, negative force. Okay. Right. So positive beta, so it's all a matter of how you define these various angles, right? We define beta positive as coming in from the right. If it was defined as coming in from the left, then Cy beta would also be positive. CL which is lift and CL which is rolling mode. This is called the dihedral derivative lateral stability derivative The reason is that we'll see, see in a little bit that lateral stability requires that CL beta be less than zero. This is the condition for lateral stability. Just like the condition for longitudinal stability was that CM alpha be less than zero. Okay. So, I'm not going to give any arguments for it right now, we'll see that in a little while. But this is the condition to state it for lateral stability, lateral static stability. Okay. But CL beta needs to be less than zero. Now, the CL beta gets contribution for four, from four main factors. You have CL beta because of something called geometric dihedral. CL beta contribution comes from wing position. A contribution from wing sweep. And 
contribution from the vertical tail. Okay. So we'll look at each one of these. The first one is geometric diameter. So if you remember from your performance class, this dihedral thing is essentially the incidence of the wing from the horizon. This angle, gamma, is called the dihedral angle. So the reason this affects CL beta is so, you know, the reason that the dihedral angle affects CL beta is that positive beta, this implies Effective angle of attack at the right wing. This is if the dihedral angle is positive. That in turn implies lift from the right wing increase and this is from a view from the back all right so this is the right wing. and this is the left wing. so if there is a positive beta coming in like that a positive diagonal angle causes the angle of attack at the right wing to increase the lift to go up and that causes a negative rolling moment. Which means that CL is less than zero. And we started at beta greater than zero. Okay, so positive beta. positive dihedral results in negative CL which implies that CL beta because of dihedral is less than zero. And this is just as well because that's what we need for lateral static stability. So a positive dihedral angle is going to contribute to positive static stability or more static stability. So you will notice that a lot of the aircraft, especially you know uh, the smaller aircraft, they have a positive dihedral being lifted up because that contributes to lateral stability. The second component of CL is wing position. So here we have either a high wing or a low wing. Okay, again, this is the back view. So the claim is is that a high wing provides negative CL beta, so it adds to stability. And a low wing gives a positive CL beta. Okay? 
So the way to look at this is, again, this is the back view, right? So this is the right wing. So if we have a positive beta, so again, start with the same kind of argument, all right? Start with a positive cause, and we'll see if the effect is positive or negative, right? So we have a positive beta, which means that the wind is coming in from the right. That's a positive beta. And the same thing would look something like that here. So the net wind on this right wing, there's an additive upward flow, right? Which means that the angle of attack increases at the right wing. So delta alpha right wing is greater than zero. And then there's a downward flow on the left wing. So the angle of attack, left wing, goes down, which obviously means increase of angle of attack means there's more lift here and less lift here. So that again means a negative rolling moment in this direction. This V1 axis is like that. Right? This is V1 into the board because we are looking at it from the back view. So a high wing contributes negative rolling moment when the side slip is positive. Okay? And if you have a wing in the center, then there is no real contribution because of wing position. Okay? By the way, there is a, a kind of an empirical expression for CL beta by D, which was given in the book, and goes something like this. CL beta by D is approximately equal to minus 1 over 6 CL alpha wing times the dihedral angle in radians times 1 over 2 lambda R1 plus 2 lambda over 1 plus lambda, where lambda is the wing taper ratio. <coughs> so that's the contribution to CL beta because of geometric diameter only. Okay? The contribution because of wing position is much more complicated and the, you know, the book essentially gives a reference to a technical report that has that study and an approximate relationship for um, CL beta because of wing position. There's no uh, simple expression there. But overall, you know, as given in these arguments, a high wing contributes negative CL beta and a low wing contributes positive CL beta. Alright, so the third one is sweep. <coughs> so this again, the claim is that CL beta because of wing sweep is negative for aft sweep and positive because of if you have a forward sweep, which is of course very rare, maybe only a handful of aircraft have a forward sweep of the wing. So this is the claim. And the justification for that claim is the following. So you have a swept wing Right. 
So again, start with the same arguments. Start with a positive data and see what happens, right? So you have, this is B1. We get a positive beta, something like that. And so the same here. <clears throat> now if you break this down into components, normal to the wing and along the wing. Okay. And the same here, normal to the wing and along the wing. And then again the right wing, which is referred to as the leading wing in this case. has a greater normal component. Okay, so a positive beta implies greater normal component on right wing if you have an aft sweep. And again this leads to greater lift on right wing. More lift here, less lift here. And that again leads to the same argument. So this is going to lead to a negative rolling moment. Okay. So again, CL beta contribution is stabilizing if you have an aft swept wing. There's a simple expression again in the book. So CL beta sweep in approximately minus 2 CL wing Y CW over B sine 2 gamma. Where Y ACW is the distance of aerodynamic center of wing <laughs> along the B2 axis. So in this figure, if this is where the aerodynamic center is, then this distance is y. Standard notation is the sweep of leading edge. So it's this angle. Right? 
So you have this horizontal tail, something like that, right? And there's a CY acting like that. So this will lead to a rolling moment because the aerodynamic center is lifted up above the reference line. Right? This is going to cause a moment like that. Right? Moment arm being this distance. Right? So this is also a negative rolling moment. As you can see, it's turning like that, right? Right wing up. So that's along minus V1. And so we get that CL beta wing, uh, vertical tail, is also less than zero. And like I said, this is easy to compute because we have the, you know, it's essentially a function of the moment arm and the CY. So CL beta wing is approximately ZB over B times CY beta. Okay, where ZB is distance of vertical tail in the dynamic center along the Z axis. So this is what we've concluded so far. CL beta has four contributions, right? We have that. Uh, stabilizing effects and then balance them out with kind of destabilizing effects. So if you looked at, for example, the C5 carrier, so this is the biggest jet in the United States, right? It has a huge wing and it has a high wing that looks something like this. And it has a sweep too. So, it, so C5 has high wing, positive sweep, and of course it has a tail, right, which is stabilizing. So we have a stabilizing high wing, a sweep, and a tail that's going to contribute to stabilization. So to balance it off, they have added in a negative dihedral. This is the destabilizing part. Gamma is less than zero. 
the negative dihedral is called an anhedral. <coughs> is added in to temper with the CL beta. derivative is Cl delta A and this is a direct control derivative because this is the partial of the rolling moment coefficient with aileron reflection. So the main reason you have ailerons is to induce a rolling moment, right, back the aircraft. So the sign of this depends obviously on the definition of what a positive reflection of the ailerons is. Greater than zero is defined as left aileron down. So if you're looking at the aircraft from the back, this is the right way. So this is what a positive aileron reflection looks like, a back view, and left aileron down. Am I drawing this wrong this whole time? This should be a cross, right, into the board? Cross means into the board. I've been drawing it as a dot. Dot means out. So we're looking at it from the back, so B1 is into the board left aileron down <coughs> and so delta A is defined as one half delta AL minus delta AR left aileron minus right aileron with a positive reflection being trailing edge down so what do you think will happen if I move the left aileron down the lift on the left wing will go up or down. It will increase, right? Because you're increasing the camber. So lift increase and this will be lower lift. So the net rolling moment is positive. So this implies CL is greater than zero. And therefore, because of the way we defined aileron deflection, CL delta A by definition is zero. I mean greater than zero. Okay. And the last derivative for rolling moment is CL delta R. This is the change in rolling moment because of a rudder reflection. And that's a weird thing, right? You press the pedal to turn the aircraft, but it also starts rolling. That's what is being said here, right? That if this is non-zero, then what will happen is that because of a rudder reflection, the aircraft will start rolling. And that's the physical meaning of this partial derivative which has to be disconcerting for the pilot, right? So what that means is every time you hit the rudder, you must also counter that with the appropriate aileron reflection. Right? So you can level the aircraft back, you know, level it back up. Okay, so let's see what this would be. Now we have already defined what a positive rudder reflection is. It's trailing edge depth, right? So only look at the rudder, right? This is going to induce a positive rudder implies a positive CY, right? We just looked at this. CY delta R was greater than zero. And if 
I look at the side view now, here's the rudder. Right? CY is acting like this, raised above. So that is what kind of a moment? Right. So CL is greater than zero. So delta R greater than zero implies CY greater than zero implies CL greater than zero, which implies CL delta R is greater than zero. So if you make a right or you know a positive rudder reflection, that's going to result in a positive rolling moment. So you need to counter that with a negative error on reflection. And that's why flying an aircraft is hard. Right? At least it used to be when all of this the pilot would need to handle when there were no automatic control systems. Right, automatic uh, flight control systems. So, in the graduate level, or you know, the kind of transition level course of this this version of flight dynamics, which is 5620. So, in 5620, we talk about something called an ARR, an aileron rudder interconnect. In the context of Automatic flight control systems. So what we will do in this course is we will design autopilots for uh, rolling motion control. We will design autopilots for yaw and motion control. And then we will hook those two up internally in the computer. Okay? So that whenever one is auto activated, the other gets activated automatically. So the pilot doesn't need to worry about it. And that's the benefit of having an automatic control system, is that all these things are taken care of by themselves. Yeah. So when the pilot just like, you know, turns the, uh, like the wheel or whatever to just like uh, initiate the ailerons and just start a roll, like the rudder will automatically yes. start adjusting everything, so everything does that? So in automatic flight systems, these, you know, if you were, if you looked at the first makeup lecture, uh, we are looking at stick fixed, right? And so these are irreversible control systems. So you, when you, you know, turn the, uh, the wheel, which is kind of you know the, the aileron uh, control, that doesn't directly is not hooked up to the aileron, right? There's a hydraulics that it goes through. So it will take the you know the input, it will go to the computer. And that, so you'll see on the dial that how much, you know, you change it a little bit, how much that is effectively being translated into an aileron reflection. That's going to be done by the computer. And that, again, the computer will look at and then automate the broader side of things as well to count it. But anyway, so point is that, you know, without an automatic flight control system, you would need to do this part by yourself as the pilot. Uh, and again, like it becomes second nature for experienced pilots that they will, you know, their leg will automatically go down when they're and press on the pedal when they are turning the or, or, or banking the aircraft to counter this uh, uh, rolling motion. And this again, like, you know, this is just a physical realization of the fact that when we wrote down the equations of motion, we had these two together, P dot and R dot. Right? Rolling moment and yawing moment were together as coupled equations. And this is one of the two realizations that when you initiate a rudder, you get a rolling moment. They are coupled, so what else would you expect? Okay. All right. So the final moment is the yawing moment. And 
we have Cn is equal to Cn0 plus Cn beta times beta plus Cn delta A delta A R delta R. This is again approximately zero because of symmetry. The derivative Cn beta is called directional stability derivative. is required to be positive for static directional stability. Again, we'll give arguments in a moment why it needs to be positive. But it needs to be positive if the aircraft is to be statically stable in the directional plane. Okay. So now the C and beta, the main contribution comes from the vertical tail. And a very small contribution from wing sweep. Okay. So this we will not look at because this is a complicated aerodynamic phenomenon. Again, not, I mean, it's outside the scope of this course. It's definitely outside the scope of my knowledge. Uh, we look at this, which is a change in yawing moment because of change in side slip angle, contribution from the vertical tail. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Again, you have the aircraft vertical tail and a positive side slip. Right? So we start with the same reasoning process. Beta greater than zero. What does this do? Well, it generates a negative side force. Right? Cyb is less than zero. And you can see that this Cy is going to cause a what kind of yawing moment. along minus b or downward, right? So it's going to cause a moment that kind of makes the aircraft turn into the side slip, right? It's going to just swing the tail around and make the aircraft line up with the incoming flow and close out the side slip. Therefore, it makes sense that beta greater than zero leads to Cn greater than zero is the requirement for static stability in directional motion. Is it C if beta greater than zero is the requirement for static stability or C if? Well, so yeah, so that's the requirement. The main contribution is from the work of take. And the vertical tail is stabilizing. So Cn beta, oh sorry, Cn v is the yawing moment generated by the vertical tail is greater than zero. So yes, technically this is what is the case. But then this contribution is almost zero. So Cn beta v is approximately equal to Cn beta of the entire aircraft. So directional stability is sometimes a problem, especially for advanced aircraft. So how many of you know about the V2 bomber? Right? There's no vertical tail. It's just a flying wing. Right? So the only source of directional stability is the sweep, and therefore it has this funky looking sweep. Right? Because that's the only source of directional stability in the B2 bomb. 
and it's minor. So it is you know marginally stable in directional stability. Not all fighter aircraft are always stable in all planes. And that's why they are fighter aircraft. They are built to maneuver, not to fly, you know, like a boat. And again, like, you know, this, again, you can derive a simple expression for this depending on the geometry and you have an expression in the book because beta leads to side force which combined with the appropriate moment arm generates the yawing moment so cn beta b is approximately cn beta for the entire aircraft is minus xv over B C Y beta where X V is the distance of vertical tail aerodynamic center from the C G. And so in this aircraft if this is where the aerodynamic center is, this is x p. Right? Because essentially that is the moment arm. The tail is being swung around the center of gravity. Is, you know what you see in, uh, on rooftops where you have the weather box. When, when there's a flow coming in a certain direction, the arrow turns into the wind, right? And that kind of shows which way the, the flow is coming from, the wind is coming from. So for that reason, this directional stability being greater than zero, meaning that the aircraft simply turns into the flow to close out the side slip, this kind of stability is also called weather box stability. that translates to turn into the wind or flow. Uh, all right. So the next partial is Cn delta A. This is again a coupling term. change in yawing moment because of an aileron defect. So why would there be a yawing moment if you deflect the aileron? This is the back view again. That's a positive aileron deflection, right? Left aileron down. <coughs> KCL squared. So increased lift coefficient means increased drag. So it's going to look something like this. On the left wing, there is greater drag because of greater lift. And as you can see, this is going to cause a yawing moment. Right? It's being pulled more from this side and less from this side. It's going to make the aircraft. Swing. And 
this yawn moment is going to be negative. So positive aileron deflection leads to greater drag, well we can say greater lift on left wing which leads to greater drag on left wing which leads to negative yawn moment, negative Cn and therefore Cn delta A is less than zero. Yes. When you're flying, I argue this is one of the reasons why the pilot would coordinate with runner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is called adverse yaw. Okay. So, like it's there. So, you know, it's called adverse. This effect is known as adverse yaw. Both are coupling terms CL delta R and CN delta A. Okay, like you're trying to bank, but then it starts drifting like that. Would you say this contributes more than, like this would be a larger number than the other one? But again, like this will be corrected by the ARI system. Sometimes you have the opposite effect uh, because what they do is, uh, again, depending on the geometry, they will add in some spoilers here so that the drag will increase on this side as well. Okay, so that the yawing moment is balanced out. So sometimes Cn delta A may be positive, and that's called a proverse yaw. It doesn't mean it's helping you, it's just, you know, adverse sounds like it's bad. And proverse sounds like it's good, but it's actually not. Both are coupling effects that are annoying. Alright, the final derivative before we talk about stability is Cn delta R and this is clearly the control derivative, control power in directional flight because it tells us how much yawing moment is generated when you make a rudder deflection. And we already know that rudder deflection is positive to the left. So this is going to generate Cy in this direction, so delta R greater than zero implies Cy greater than zero, which implies this is going to cause a negative yawing moment, right? Upward. It implies that Cn delta R doesn't see. And that's fine. I mean, you just need to know what the sign is so you can make the appropriate rudder reflection. Uh, yes? So, uh, I think my work is starting to fail me a little bit because maybe we could go like way before uh, and determine on a body frame the uh, positive B3 was pointing toward the Earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so, would a, a rudder deflection to the left? Yawing moment that is actually the element negative B3 axis. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's so, why it's oh, next. Okay, so I was, I was kind of confused as to why they uh, consider that a left, just in general, left deflection as positive, which like, would it be then it was just the uh, other way. So you are getting into you know why that was defined like that, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why it was defined like that. Maybe so. You have to look at the other derivatives, right? Uh, whoever made this convention must have thought that you're a pilot, right? 
Yeah. Well, why do you think rather reflex has to come? This is defined like this. I, I mean, I, it's a definition. I'm sure there's a good reason for it. No, I don't know. Yes, like flying wasn't hard enough, so they had one of these even more confusing the convention. Well, yeah, I mean, so the thing is that, you know, it, it might help with this definition, but then it might screw up some other, yeah. The only thing I can see is because the force is in the positive in two direction. Yeah, okay. right. So CY delta R is positive. But that means C and delta R is going to be negative. Can't have it both ways. Okay, so that takes care of all the derivatives. And so we get to the point of trim and stability. And this is again lateral directional. Lateral meaning in Rome and directional meaning in New York. So for longitudinal, if you remember, trim meant that CM was equal to zero. Right? No pitching moment. Here, trim means CL is equal to zero, no rolling moment, and CM is equal to zero. And typically, not always, but often, side slip will also be zero, which is called coordinated flight. So those are the conditions for trip. So what would you need to do to determine the conditions here? Well, you will need to set CL equal to zero. So CL is CL beta beta CL delta A delta A. Right? And then CN is CN beta times beta CN delta A. But then if you set beta equal to zero as well, then typically we get that delta A is equal to delta R is equal to zero is a good solution, always. If you're flying trim, you don't expect to be deflecting the rudder or the aileron. Okay? Except if there is time, we'll look at one special condition in which you're coming into land in crosswind, and you you know to keep trim you have to deflect the rudder. Okay? So for any type of coordinated flight. Typically, delta R is going to be delta A is equal to B0. All right, stability. There are two main conditions here. One, like we had stated, we need CL beta to be less than zero. This is called roll stability. And CL beta needs to be greater than zero. This is weather clock stability or directional stability. So we have already given arguments for this one. Right? If there is a flow coming in from the right, make the aircraft turn to the right. And that way you close out the side flow. Right? And so turning to the right corresponds to a downward yawing moment which is positive. So positive beta leading to positive yawing moment is stability. And so C and beta needs to be greater than zero. This is slightly more counterintuitive.
And the argument goes something like as follows. So here we start with positive roll deflection. So this is a perturbation. Assume that there is a positive roll perturbation on an aircraft, the high level. we start with the perturbation in the row. So positive row perturbation makes the right wing go down and it induces a positive side slip. So how will you correct for this? If you were to correct it by rolling the aircraft back, then what kind of rolling motion would you need? A negative, right? Because this positive roll leads to a positive side slip, but you can correct for this positive roll by rolling it back up, right wing up, correct using negative CL. And so the way to close out this perturbation is to induce a negative rolling moment. And therefore, stability demands, roll stability demands CL beta to be left. things that I want to do before closing out. And on Wednesday, like I promised, we'll look at um, dynamic stability, which is much more exciting than this. Alright. So the one case I want to look at is one when we have non-zero side slip. And this is the case of crosswind land, cross landings. Okay. 
So here's the air strip. Center line, and there is a crossway going this way. And there's an aircraft coming into land. Okay. So, how do you make this happen? So, you know, the problem obviously being that this wind is going to induce a side step so the aircraft can drift away from the strip and <coughs> land on the grass. So, the first option is to move forward, but then hold your attitude such that you turn into the wind, right? So, you have a V infinity coming in like this and crosswind. So your net would be something like that, right? So change your attitude so that here's the strip, crosswind, V infinity. So you would like to be aligned with that. So have the aircraft aligned with the net flow. But of course, it's moving forward. Right? Its attitude is such that it's aligned with the wind. So this is fine until you hit the tarmac, right? because the aircraft will start moving this way. So you have to immediately turn the aircraft so that the wheels get aligned with the airstrip. If you take option number one. Okay. So option one is to align or change attitude. To align with cross flow. And so what this does is maintains beta equal to zero. Right? Because you are aligned with the flow, there is no net, you know, the V net, uh, let's call this V forward, not V infinity. So that this will end up being V infinity. So there is no size there. But like I said, there is a problem there that we need to change direction immediately upon touchdown. Otherwise, you're going to run off the air, uh, airstrip. Option two is to live with a positive size there. Align with the aligned wheels with airstrip. So what that means is, here's the airstrip, and you come in like that. Don't care about the crosswind. Well, you care about it, but not by changing that. So, V forward. And so here's going to be your V infinity. But the aircraft is like this, right? So you can see that there is a positive side slip. So if you want to come in aligned with the air airstrip, facing forward, not like that, then you're going to have to live with a side slip, which is non zero. And the way to counter that is going to be through a rudder and aileron reflection. Okay? So this will become a case, option two becomes a case of flying trim, but uncoordinated. Which means that beta is greater than two. Well, beta is not equal to zero, let's just say. But you still want to maintain trim. So for trim, we know the conditions are that CL is equal to 0 and CN is equal to 0. And this translates to CL beta times beta.
So you get two equations for training. But there are three unknowns. The unknowns are beta, delta A, and delta R. But beta is not really an unknown. If you can measure the crosswind, then you can find what the side step is from the geometry. So here's the crosswind. Here's the aircraft forward speed. This is V infinity. So this angle is beta. Question? So beta is equal to tan inverse this over that, VCW crosswind over VF, or sine inverse, this over that, crosswind. So the tower will call and tell you, hey, you're coming into land at a crosswind, and you have a crosswind of 10 knots, or 10 miles an hour. Okay? And based on that, if you know your approach speed, right, the net, this is the measured airspeed, which you will get from a feet of motion. Right? So you have this, and this is being given to you. You know what the side step is. Right? So you can use that in this equation, set of equations, and you get two equations in two unknowns. Right? And the equations that you need to solve then are, I'm going to write this in matrix form. CL beta, sorry, CL delta A, CL delta R, CN delta A, delta A delta R is equal to minus beta minus beta. Right? So you can call this matrix A. Call this vector B. So aileron and gravity deflection are A inverse. Okay. Where beta was computed from there. Sine inverse crosswind over your net flow speed. And of course, all these parameters are known, right? This this comes from the aircraft uh, handbook. Its properties of the aircraft, and as well as these derivatives. So, if you're landing in crosswind, then you need, in general, a positive aileron and rudder deflection. If you're going to come in aligned with the airstrip, right, and not be turning into the wind to cancel out later. There is only so much wind you can handle. Right? It, as the crosswind starts increasing, this beta will start increasing, and the, so the right hand start will, side will start blowing up. Which means that in general, the aileron deflection and the rudder deflection required will start blowing up. So you may hit saturation somewhere. Right? Because if you keep deflecting the rudder beyond a certain point, the flow will suffer. Right, and the rudder will lose effectiveness. Should V A and VR, they should always share the same side? No, that's not required. Right? I mean, it will depend on the constitution of you know, the matrix A and vector B. And the value of beta.
So you know, I, I'll write a couple of homework problems for this so you'll see what the numbers turn out to be. Uh, OK. So let's close out static stability then with a quick summary of all the derivatives that we've seen and their signs and the requirements for static stability. delta R 
Well, CL delta A has a name here, of course. This is the control derivative, the roll control derivative, because aileron deflection controls the roll. So that's a direct uh, connection there. CL delta R was greater than zero, and this is a cross coupling derivative. Cross coupling. because it pertains to change in rolling moment when there's a deflection in the rudder. Next we have C and beta. This needs to be greater than zero for static stability, static directional stability. And for that reason, this is called the directional stability derivative. And we have two control derivatives, Cn delta A. This turned out to be less than zero, and this was called the adverse yaw. Well, less than zero is adverse yaw. It's a cross-coupling derivative because it indicates change in yawing moment upon a uh, aileron deflection. So it's a coupling term. And finally, Cn delta R, which is also a control power term in the directional direction or in the directional plane. How much yawing moment can be generated upon the drug and this turned out to be less than zero. Okay, so this is called a directional control power or rudder control power. So, there are three key boxes here that for longitudinal static stability, this for roll static stability, and finally, this for directional static stability. Okay. So when you design your aircraft, if it's a transport aircraft, you have to make sure that those three sign, signs are followed. The requirements are a little more relaxed for fighter aircraft. Right? Because the objective not always is to make a stable vehicle. The idea is to more look at the maneuverability. So you can get away with smaller stability margins so long as you have an automatic flight control system so that the pilot is not all the time just trying to fly sta stable. Right? That is being done by the automatic flight control system. And you are able to fly and maneuver fast okay? while being stable, augmented by Computer. Uh, what's the effect of for fighter jets of having uh, two uh, uh, rudder in the form? So again, like those are that's done to counter the effect of one. So you know you have it, it kind of presents a, a, a symmetric configuration, right? So all the effects that you saw today because of asymmetries, those get kind of ironed out when you have two of them, right? So in fifty six twenty. A large portion of this course looks at something called SAS. These are stability augmentation systems. So I taught this course in the spring this year. And we designed so these essentially are autopilots. Right? If you don't have these conditions, or if you don't have enough stability margins, you design these systems so that you can augment the inherent stability of the aircraft with computer-generated stability. So the computer will give the appropriate input to keep the rudder deflection in a certain way that you have enough stability or you're able to fly in state and so on. All right. So we'll see you tomorrow with uh, dynamic stability.